Well, good morning, church. It's a blessing to be with you this morning and to be able to share with you from the Word of God. It's always a privilege to stand behind this pulpit, um, and I count it very much so. So if you have God's Word with you this morning, I want you to take it and turn with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 2. Philippians, chapter 2. It was, uh, we did read it this morning, but let's read it again. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1, all the way down to verse uh, 11. The Holy Scriptures say, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man to his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Friends, the title for today's message is The Servant of Jesus Christ. The Servant of Jesus Christ. Christ. Recently in Brother Paul's Bible study, we've been taking a look at uh, the epistle of Jude. And I was, as we began, I was struck by which this apostle and martyr for Christ introduces himself uh, in his letter to the fellow believers. He says that he is a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. This introduction powerfully portrays the message in which I hope to convey to you this morning. For instead of Jude arrogantly proclaiming that he was the apostle of Jesus Christ, he says that he is the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Instead of proclaiming that uh, he was those things, he did this with humility, did he not? And this shows the humility, the grace and the servanthood of this great man of God. And I think it is these themes which we need to address in a deeper study this morning. I wish to present to you three points. Number one, the example of service. Number two, the enabling grace of service. And number three, we see the enjoyment of service. But before we begin, let's ask our Lord's blessing upon this message. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we have a time now around your word, around your word. And we just pray, Father, that you would bless this time. Lord, uh, we need to be servants of you. We need to be your servants, Lord God, for you have called us to do so. Lord, I pray for these hearers here this morning that you may bless them, Lord, that you may edify them. And I, as your servant here, I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, that I may preach your word with clarity, with boldness, and with power for those you have commanded me to do so. We do love you here this morning. We exalt you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The congregation, the matter of being a servant for Christ is one which is of vital importance today. You see, we live in a world where people are self-centered. They are selfish. People who focus on me, myself, and I. People who don't look out for the needs of others, but only for the needs of themselves. This, my friends, is an indictment on a world which knows not God. But sadly, this is not just the case for the godless individual, but is increasingly finding its attitudes amongst those whom name the name of Christ. For this self-serving, Sin-serving way of life should not be so for the Christian, one who has been purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, one whom is no longer his own, but one whom it belongs to the Most High God. For the believer is not to serve sin, nor is he to serve self, but he is to serve the Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. But what does it mean to be a servant of Christ? Well, the Greek word for servant is doulos, which means a slave, one whom gives himself wholly unto the will of another. Today, the word slave has negative connotations with it, but it should not be so. Often when we think of slaves, we think of the slave trade from the 16th century, which of course was on the basis of racism and cruel and harsh treatment from their masters. But 
More often than not, slavery in the New Testament was used as a means of economic assistance. As people, when facing a debt or a situation in which they could not get out of for their family, they would then sell themselves into slavery. Some even willingly chose to be slaves, as to have all their needs met by their master. If you see many today would fight back at the idea of slavery, and would say it is evil, but I want to remind you, dear friends, that you are a slave to something this morning. You need to serve one or two things, sin or the Saviour. Jesus Christ said so much in Matthew 6, 24. He said, For no man can serve two masters, for he will, evil, he will either hate the one and love the other. He will either hold to one and despise the other. For this wicked world loved their sin and consequently hate the Saviour. They hold ever tightly to their master's sin and therefore despise the true master, Jesus Christ. Again, in John 8, 34, when confronting the unbelieving Pharisees, our Lord said, Verily, verily, or most truly, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. Many unbelievers today think that they are free, that they are not in slavery, but I submit to you that they are indeed in slavery. They are indeed in bondage to sin. The lust of the world, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life are their wicked masters and rulers. And they are indeed in bondage to them. Their sin nature is their trinical Lord and Master. And therefore they are held captive to do its will. But the Christian is freed from sin. Hallelujah. At the moment of salvation, he's not been freed only from the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin in one's life. The believer in Jesus Christ has been given the precious Holy Spirit, whereby he is now at liberty not to serve sin, but to serve the risen Saviour. A great apostle Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, our apostle, he said so much in Romans, and he has an interesting play on words. He says, For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you in those things, whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end thereof is everlasting life. But you see, the Christian has already died. In fact, he died when he accepted Jesus Christ as his saviour, and therefore has been given life, life of righteousness, where, whereby he is able now not to serve sin, but to serve the saviour. So I ask you, dear saint of God, whom are you serving this morning? Whom are you yielding yourself unto? To sin or to the saviour? Unrighteousness or to righteousness? To the old nature or to the new nature? My friends, be the servant of Jesus Christ and yield yourself unto God, unto the precious Holy Spirit, for therein lies true life, not in bondage to the wicked master of sin, but in blessed slavery unto the better and perfect master, Jesus Christ. If you would, church, hold your place there in Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be back there shortly, but turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 9, the Gospel of Luke chapter 9. And while you get in there, I'm going to read from John chapter 12, where the Lord Jesus explains how one is to serve the Lord. He says, if any man serve me, let him follow me where I am. There also shall my servant be. Beloved, a servant of Jesus Christ is a follower of Jesus Christ. He's not a follower of the world. He's not a follower of the evil ways of the world. He's not a follower of his sin nature. He's a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're there in Luke chapter 9, look down at verse 23. Our Lord puts forth how one is to follow him. And he says unto them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. If anyone seeks to be a servant of Jesus Christ, he must be reminded of the economy of God. That only through death cometh life. Only through dying can life be made manifest. In both passages we just looked at, our Lord explains how one is to serve and to follow Christ and follow his ways. It is by dying to self, dying to sinful lusts, and thus manifesting the righteous life which Christ now offers his people. In order to be a slave of Christ, we must crucify, or the Bible says, mortify our flesh with its desires, not weekly, not monthly, 
Not just when you feel like it, but the Bible says daily. The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. And so we must do so. We must do, abhor our sin and cleave unto Christ. We must abhor our evil ways and cleave unto Jesus. You see, my friend, this bears the true marks of a servant of Christ, one whom is not enslaved to sin, but enslaved to the Saviour. Dear Christian, do you bear these marks of a servant of God? Can you with confidence say, I am his servant? We would do well if daily we would make a pledge to serve not sin, but the Saviour. We would do well if daily we would be reminded of Christ's admonition to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him, to serve him. May we as the redeemed do so. Amen. Elsewhere in Scripture, though, the Holy Spirit informs us. Otherwise, a servant of the Lord is to behave and to direct his conversation while upon the serve. The servant of the Lord is one whom is wholly devoted to Jesus. The servant of the Lord is not slothful, but he is busy for Christ. The servant of the Lord is humble, esteeming others better than himself. The servant of the Lord is one who does not practice sin, but practices righteousness. The servant of the Lord is hospitable, one whom encourages and loves the saints. The servant of the Lord is one who does not fear man, but fears God and seeks only how to please him. The servant of the Lord operates in his spiritual gifts. And his holy calling, and lastly, the servant of the Lord is one whom sacrifices himself for others. And indeed, it is these characteristics which are best demonstrated and perfectly exemplified in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So we come to the example of service. The example of service. And what better a picture does it mean to be a servant of God than what the picture which is painted by the apostle by uh, the prophet Isaiah, who said in Isaiah 53 of the suffering servant. The prophesied one through his incarnation who would become the lowly servant of the Father. And as such, he has shown us the perfect pattern in how we are too to serve our Father. Look down at Philippians chapter 2 once again, church. Philippians chapter 2. It says in verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Church, we see in our text the type of servant Jesus was. He was both a humble servant, but he was also an obedient and sacrificial servant. It is these two examples of Christ's servanthood which I will now address. So firstly, Christ. The humble servant, the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, who was being worshipped by an innumerable company of angels alongside the Father and the Spirit, who was reigning over the entire universe. Yet, through his incarnation, he took upon himself the form of a servant, and thus he humbled himself. Though God of very God, this Jesus Christ, through his voluntary love for mankind, added unto himself human nature. And he gave up his divine rights and privileges as a second person of a triune God, and thus he emptied himself. What humility we see in the incarnation. What lowliness we see in the person of the Son of God. He made himself of no reputation. He came to this earth not to be born in a glorious castle, but in a lowly stable. He came as the prophesied Messiah of Israel, not on a warrior horse, but on a meek and lowly donkey. I also note in Mark chapter 10 of the servant life and ministry of our blessed Lord, he said, For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, unto, but he came to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. My fellow believers, this Son of Man came not to be served, but he came to serve. He came with humility and lowliness of mind to serve his creation. One of the best examples of this, if you would turn with me to John chapter 13. The Gospel of John, chapter 13. This is, of course, the famous story of our Lord in the upper room, the night he was betrayed. And we see him here washing the feet of his disciples. John, chapter 13. Reading from verse 1, the Bible says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, 
Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper uh, being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God, and he went to God. He riseth from supper, and took aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. After that he poureth water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Jump down to verse 12, and it says, So after he had washed their feet, and taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, for ye say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you should do as I have done unto you. A remarkable text, is it not? The Lord and Master of the universe, the one who knows all things, the one who created all things, sees to it to wash the feet of his disciples. You see, this lowly task would have been done by the lowliest of servants. Indeed, not even Jewish slaves would wash the feet of their masters. And yet we see here the master of all being the servant of all. What humility, what grace this teaches mankind. If you see, this, this teacher did not just uh, te teach them love, but he showed them love. He did not just teach them humility, he showed them humility. No doubt this act of servitude by the Messiah stands in stark contrast to the attitude of the disciples whom were recently arguing whom would be the greatest. Jesus here powerfully shows that great kingdom truth that whosoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whosoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. But as I mentioned earlier, this attitude of pride, the seeking of preeminence and position is contrary the behaviour the Christian is ought to, to demonstrate. Just as the Apostle Paul says that we are to have this same mind of Christ, the attitude of putting others before yourself, esteeming others better than yourself, looking out for the needs of not only yourself but also of others. We need to emulate Christ. We need to follow his ways, his perfect example. May we not look inward, may we look outward unto Christ, unto others. How can I serve them? May we do likewise, amen. But, dear Christian, not only was our Saviour a humble servant, he was also an obedient and sacrificial servant. Look down our text once again in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Our Lord Jesus Christ was the obedient one. The one sent to complete the Father's will. The life of the Son of Man was a life in total submission unto the Father, in total obedience unto Him, as He famously proclaimed in John 6, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of Him that sent me. If you would, church, turn with me again to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. Matthew 26. We see our Lord through his glorious incarnation showed us the way, how to please the Father through, through total submission to his will. Jesus Christ is the Son of Man in his humanity, wholly relied upon the Father and the Spirit for his obedience in order that he may be that perfect example unto us. This was also necessary for our salvation, for him to fulfill all righteousness and be that spotless Lamb of God, to be that sacrificial Lamb of God which takes away the sins of of the world. If you're there in Matthew 26, look down at verse 36. The Bible says, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed and said, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. We see in this account of our Lord in the garden of Gethsemane, the night before his eventual death, the agonizing pain he was about to endure on that cross, but taking upon himself the sins of the whole world. He was about to drink that cup 
of the wrath of the Father. And he says, oh, my Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, he says, not as I will, but as thou wilt. The Lord Jesus in his humanity submitted unto the will of the Father in going to that cross. He was obedient unto death. Amen. Obedient unto the death of the cross. Our blessed Saviour had many an obstacle to deal with him, to take him off that perfect track of obedience unto the Father. He was obedient in the face of the unbelieving Pharisees. He was obedient in the temptations and attacks of the armies of Satan. He was obedient in the face of even his own disciples. And yet, in spite of all what was thrown at him, he remained faithful unto his Father. He remained faithful to the plan which the Father had for him. My friends, we too shall have many an obstacle which try to get us off track from serving the Lord. Whether that be the flesh, whether that be the world, whether that be the devil. But we have a perfect example, one with which to look to, one with which to emulate, one with which to follow. We must, as Christ did, subject our will unto the will of the Father. We must sacrifice our will for his so I ask you, what is it that's stopping you from obeying the Father's will for your life? What is it that you need to surrender unto the will of the Father? I pray this morning the Holy Spirit shall impress this upon you and may give you the strength and the grace by which to do so. I also note in our text in Philippians chapter 2, the sacrificial nature of the servant Jesus. And it is this which teaches us how to lay down our lives for the sake of Jesus in sacrificial service. You see, often people want to serve God, but not so much when there's a cost involved. Many a Christian will serve God faithfully, but when it comes to cost them something, they back away in fear. They back away in cowardice and say, no, I can't do that. I can't give that up. So if we're going to serve God, we must count the cost. We must be willing to leave things behind. To go forward as a sacrificial servant, we must leave behind our pride, our selfish ambitions, our carnal desires. We must be willing to sacrifice our time, our energy, our money, and most importantly, our sins for his sake and for his glory. Many today, to think to be an obedient and sacrificial servant for Christ, one must go away to the far-off lands and the jungles of Africa and sacrifice one's life as a missionary. And my friend, you can serve Christ. You can sacrifice your life for Christ right where you are today in your everyday life by denying yourself, taking up your cross, in obedience to the Lord Jesus. You can serve him right now in sacrificing your sinful ways for the cause of Christ. But the question is, are you willing, as Christ did, to sacrifice all for the glorious cause of God? What is it that you need to sacrifice this morning and give up for Christ? A pertinent question we would all do wonder to, 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 to ponder in self-examination in our hearts this morning. But not only, church, do we find the word of God concerning this topic of servanthood, the example of service, but I note we also see the enabling grace of service. If you would, beloved saints, turn with me again in your Bibles to the epistle of the Ephesians, chapter 2. Ephesians, chapter 2. How is it possible to be that humble servant? How is it possible to be that obedient and sacrificial servant? How is it possible to be the servant of Jesus Christ? Well, I submit to you this morning it is through the glorious grace of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he said he was full of grace. So we also must rely upon the grace power of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is ours this morning. Look down at Ephesians chapter 2, church. Ephesians 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 8. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You see, at the moment of salvation, the moment one trusts Christ, a sinner is then for miraculously transformed into a saint. And as such, enrolls as a servant. He enrolls as a servant into the workforce of Jesus Christ. He is now a new creation in Christ, not through the merriest tourist works of himself, but through the works of Christ and through the grace of God. Indeed, by God's grace, we are saved. And by God's grace, we are then enabled to serve and to minister, a vessel now fit for the master's use. The Apostle Paul tells us in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, he says, for the, for the same grace which now justifies us is the same grace which then we sanctifies us as well. The Father has a plan for all of his children, 
but as a plan of sanctification and service, a plan of growing into the likeness of Christ and in service to him. It is through his abundant grace by which he bestows upon his children, but then they are then enabled to serve the king. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 implores us. It says, Wherefore, we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and with godly fear. For it is the grace of God which enables us to serve the Saviour. For without it, without him, the God of all grace, we can do nothing. Our Lord Jesus Christ said so much in his disciples. He said, without me, you can do nothing. Not you can do some things, you can do a little bit. No, you can do nothing without the Lord Jesus Christ, without his grace. You see, many today serve God erroneously out of legalism because it's their religion and therefore they know not the grace of God in truth. I think of those of the religion of the Jehovah's Witnesses who go out knocking countless doors, laboring long hours of the day and spreading their false gospel far and wide in hopes of doing enough to enter into the kingdom of God. But my friend, may I remind you, we don't serve God because we have to. We do it because we want to. We don't do it because to get saved. We do it because we are saved. Amen. Because he's forgiven us of all our transgressions. Because he's redeemed us from our sins with his precious blood. Because he has delivered us from the law and the demands of it. That we might live to serve him freely through his grace and through his spirit. Furthermore, the motive for serving Christ, the motive for serving God out of fear and out of moral obligation shall only get one so far and then they shall trip up and they shall fall. We then should be spurred out to serve God out of legalism, but out of love. Not for our glory, but for his glory. Amen. For the glory of God the Father. My friend, true service to God is not done out of fear, but is done out of the constraining love and grace of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul Apostle to the Gentiles said so much in 2 Corinthians 5.14. He says, for the, for the love of Christ constraineth us, and that he died for all, that they which live should not live henceforth unto themselves, but unto him which died for him and rose again for him. And my fellow believers, not because of fear do we serve God, rather because of the gospel of grace, that the God of all the whole universe should die for me, and therefore this constrains me, this compels me that I should not live henceforth for myself, but for him who died for me, Jesus Christ, my Saviour. So I echo the words of the famous hymn by Charles Wesley. It says, Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Once we get a hold of this, once the man of God gets a hold of this, of the revelation of the gospel of grace, he is then compelled, he is pressed on from all sides to serve the true and living God. The Apostle Paul elsewhere in Scripture said that it was by God's grace in which he served and ministered Christ. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Church, it was through God's grace by which this apostle turned from his sin of self-righteousness to the Saviour. It was through God's grace that on that road to Damascus, he experienced the abundant love of his Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. It was also through God's grace by which he laboured more abundantly than all the other apostles. And thus, it should be the same for us. Amen. Dear congregation, use not the grace which is upon you in order to serve yourself, in order to give occasion to the flesh, to serve your sin, but rather use it and its power which is upon you to serve the risen Saviour because he died for us. Is Jesus Christ not worthy? Is the glorious Son of God not worthy to be served? I proclaim to you this morning, he most certainly is worthy to be served. Amen. He is most worthy for us to lay in our lives in humble obedience and sacrificial service. So I ask you, dear Christian, do you seem to be serving God out of fear, out of legalism? I implore you to go back to the gospel of grace, to remind yourself of his love, which is towards you. And I believe this shall free you from apathy of service into true service through the enabling grace and love of Jesus Christ. May we as his chosen vessels, as his blood-bought saints, then grow in his grace, grow in his love, grow in the revelation of his gospel, and thus in service to him. So we've seen this morning the example of service, the enabling grace of service. And lastly, dear saints, may I touch on this morning the enjoyment 
of service, the enjoyment of service. As I mentioned at the outset of my message, we live in a society today which seeks pleasure over righteousness. People who seek to serve self and sin instead of serving God and other people. You see, they who do so are the most miserable people of all. They have many possessions. They have much wealth. They have much fame. But I'm sure if you ask them, they would truly be loved, that they would have true happiness and be satisfied. They would give you a resounding no. Dear congregation, sin never satisfies. A life of serving self never brings true joy. Proverbs 27.20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. For you see, if one seeks enjoyment in serving sin and serving self, he will ultimately be left feeling void, feeling meaningless, feeling lost. The one who endeavors to fulfill his wicked lust is always left feeling wanting and unsatisfied. For a life of pleasure cannot satisfy your soul, but only a life committed to serving Jesus Christ. Amen. Or it may have been joyous in the moment, but the end is anything but. For a life of sin, a life of serving self does not bring joy, but rather destruction. But in contrast, a spirit-filled life of service to Jesus Christ brings true joy, true enjoyment, true fulfillment and satisfaction. May I end this morning by contrasting the two. A life dedicated to serving sin and self, and a life of serving Jesus Christ. One such person whom looked to serve his sin, to serve himself and his simple desires, to attain that enjoyment, to attain that satisfaction, was a person I'm sure you're most familiar with, King Solomon. Last place I'll have you turn this morning is to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Book of Ecclesiastes chapter 2. For those who are unaware, King Solomon was the third and final king in the United Kingdom of Israel, whom reigned for 40 years. He was, he, it was he who wrote the books of the Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and the majority of the book of Proverbs. His name meant in peace, and peace it was which was given unto him and his kingdom. The, the scriptures declare so much that they dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his tree. The man of God then asked the Lord for wisdom and the Lord granted him this wisdom. He was indeed the wisest man of all. He also exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wealth. He most certainly had it all, did he not? For this King Solomon, he was a great man of God. He started off well, serving God and building the glorious temple and dedicating it unto Jehovah. But this changed when his simple heart was stirred. When the lust of the eyes and the pride of life got a hold of him, in marrying wives from other heathen nations, and this turned his soul to them, to serve them, to worship them. Look down at Ecclesiastes chapter 2, church, and verse 10. The Bible says, Whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. This was the portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works which my hands had wrought, on the labor which I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. There was no profit under the sun. He was a man that sowed to his flesh, and what did he reap? Well, it wasn't joy. It was rather vanity and vexation of spirit and destruction. Oh, to be so wise and yet so foolish. For a life without following God is most meaningless and most vain. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. Without Christ. But you see, we were created not to serve self nor sin, but to serve the living God. Each person has a hole in their heart which only the Lord can fill. As Pascal once said, there is a God shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. Indeed, this hole or vacuum cannot be filled with the vanity of sin or a life serving self but only through the glorious knowledge of Jesus Christ and in service to him. One such person who truly knew this, one such fellow who understood what it meant to live a fulfilling life, a, a self-sacrificing life of service to God, was the Apostle Paul, and oh, what joy he had, amen. This was a man who gave up all for the Lord Jesus, one whom was once a blasphemer, he was once a Pharisee of the Pharisees, one who persecuted the church of God with all his zeal, with all his might, and yet... 
Once he met his risen Lord on the road to Damascus, he was changed forever. He went straight away in service to his master and preached Christ immediately in the synagogue. He declared that he was the Son of God. Although he suffered much for his service of the Lord, he never lost his joy, did he? He knew that to live was Christ, and to die was gain. He counted all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. He suffered the loss of all things. He counted them garbage. He counted them dung that he might win Christ. Through his service to Jesus Christ, through his ministry and apostleship for Christ, he suffered greatly. He gives them a list of these things in 2 Corinthians 11. He says that he was imprisoned and flogged. He was given lashes by the Jews. He was beaten with rods. He was pelted with stones. He was shipwrecked. He was in danger in many places. He went without sleep. He went without food. He went without clothes. And in spite of all this, he was joyful in his service to his risen Saviour. Indeed, while in prison in Rome, he wrote the epistle to the Philippian church and he said, Rejoice in the Lord. And again I say, Rejoice. How could this great apostle remain so joyful, though, in the face of all these happenings? Well, I submit to you this morning, it was through the love and grace of his master, Jesus Christ. For this servant of Jesus knew and thus experienced the breadth, the, le- the, the length, the depth, and the height of the love of God in the person of his Saviour, Jesus Christ. This then compelled him, this constrained him to serve his master. He knew it not to be a chore or a drudgery to serve God and to suffer for Christ, but rather a most glorious honour. He knew that Christ's yoke was easy and that his burden was light, and thus he served his Lord with joy. He also knew that this light affliction of service for Christ was but momentary, for it worked in him a far more exceeding weight of glory, the scriptures say. What was this doing was impacting not just here and now. What he was doing is not just impacting here, but it was impacting eternity. Lives saved in the person of Jesus Christ. Psalm 126 verse 6 says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. For instead, instead of like Solomon sowing to his flesh, this great apostle sowed to the spirit and to the kingdom of God. Instead of reaping vanity and destruction, he reaped for himself joy, rewards, and eternal treasures in heaven. He knew what was to come, a crown of life which would be given unto him and indeed given unto all Christ's faithful servants. And he encourages us and motivates us in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour is not In vain in the Lord. O those whom labour for Christ, those whom in humility and sacrificial obedience serve Christ shall never have to worry about their rewards being lost. For the God of grace knows all, he sees all, and shall reward all for their faithful service. As I noted earlier, the words of the Lord Jesus, he said, If anyone would be first, they must be last and servant of all. For this, my friends, is the paradox of the economy of God. Those that exalt themselves shall be humbled, but those that humble themselves, they are the ones which shall be exalted. Dear Christian, the more we give, the more we receive. The more we sacrifice for Christ, the more God blesses us. This is why submitting to Jesus in humble servitude is joyous. For just as our blessed law was exalted to the highest Uh, spot in heaven, we too may be exalted with rewards and become co-heirs with Christ to rule and reign with him in glory. Does this excite you this morning? I trust it does. Indeed, in the new Jerusalem, we should not only be singing to our king, we shall be also serving our king and we shall be ever joyous in his presence. Revelation 22 says, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the lamb shall be in it and his servants shall Serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, no need, no need for candles, neither light of the sun. For the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. What encouraging words the scriptures brings us in reference to our eternity. And what motivation this brings us in regards to service by which we are to render unto our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. 
The rewards which were in store for the faithful servant of Jesus. The rewards, the crowns, the privileges, and the glory. A blessed master said, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Furthermore, the scriptures state elsewhere that I have not seen nor ear heard, either entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them which love him. My dearly beloved, Jesus Christ indeed is coming again soon. In the twinkling of an eye, with the trump of God, he shall descend from heaven and take us away to be in his awesome presence. No, what a day that shall be, amen. Oh, what a day that shall be. But he's also coming with rewards to hand out, with crowns to distribute to those who have been his faithful servants. So I'll leave you this morning with some questions by which to ponder in your heart. Are you serving Jesus Christ, or are you serving yourself and your sin? Are you willing to suffer and sacrifice and service for Christ, for his glorious cause? Are you, as a blood-bought saint of God, obedient to his call in your life and denying yourself and your sin and taking up his cross? Are you obedient to your blessed master? May we, as his representatives on earth, so serve Christ with all that we have, with all joy, with all love, with all humility, with all obedience, that we may hear those most blessed words when he comes again, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this brief time to look into your word about what it means to be a servant of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for your abundant grace, which is upon us, that we may indeed serve you. Oh, Lord, it's not a drudgery to serve you. It is a most, most joyous thing to serve you, our Saviour. So I pray, Lord God, for all these here, your saints, Lord, that they may be encouraged to serve you in a greater capacity. Lord, the days are growing darker. Lord, and we see that your return is oh so soon. So may you just spur us on to serve you with a greater capacity, Lord God, for there are so many lost souls which need to be saved. There is so much work for us to do here. But Lord, we need your grace. We need your love, which shall spur us on. And we pray, Father, that you would give us those things, that we may serve you, Lord, not as a uh, drudgery, but we know it is a most blessed thing to serve you. And so we proclaim here uh, your, your death, your burial, and your resurrection. And is this, this, this gospel which, um, which pushes us forward in service to you. Oh, Lord, how we love you. Oh, Lord, how we praise you. Oh, Lord, how we wish to serve you. And we pray, Lord God, you would be honoured here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.